Welcome to Why Rocks, a BYU Department of Geological Sciences podcast. We are pleased to be here today with Dr. Barry Bearkiller Bickmore. And uh, just a little about Dr. Bickmore. Uh, he enjoys kayaking and hiking. And something really unique about Barry, who's been with our department for 22 years, and I am just learning this today, he can make his tongue look like a snail. Barry, are you willing to demonstrate that for our studio audience? Um, how much money's on the table? <laughs> I would have to ask Kevin, how much money's on the table? I'm getting a big zero, but <laughs> but, but he, he can get a couple of candy bars could be in your future, but you can't uh, have them anyway. All right, anyway. well, here, here okay. you go. Look at that. I don't think I can do that. Plays well with the kids. <laughs> so are you a nursery leader? Primary teacher. Oh, that's it. Yeah, you, how many of your primary kids know you can do that? None of them yet. yet. But the year is only <laughs> six months in. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to start off at the beginning. We're going to ask Dr. Bickmore the first question. We're going to ask, why geology? How did you get started going down this particular road? Well, I was uh, um, a chemistry major when I was a freshman. Boo! And I did fine. <laughs> but then I went on a mission, and I was sitting there on my bed. Uh, I, I think it was in Iowa City or somewhere. And um, I uh, was looking through the catalog to decide what classes to, to do and everything. And um, I uh, heard a voice that said, you should change your major to geology. And then I thought, oh, Ken Hamblin's daughter is in my mission. And <laughs> she's really good looking. So <laughs> maybe, <laughs> I never talked to ever, her ever. But <laughs> anyway, so I rationalized it as, as maybe that's a good idea. So I, when I got back to BYU, I walked in and changed my major. I am so glad we are doing this. I mean, I've, I've known you for years, and I have never heard that story. Oh. And when I went into the department office to change my major, they had a really good-looking secretary. So I thought, well, maybe that's the reason. You know? but <sighs> there you didn't, go. Didn't work out either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you are married to a beautiful woman. Yep. Um, and we should talk about that for a second. How much do you feel your you know, advancement to continuing status at BYU and your you know, promotion to full professor, how much of that is related to this amazing tray of cookies that your beautiful wife brings into the department every Christmas. Well, I wasn't in on the discussions about whether <laughs> to keep me around or not, but um, I can sort of imagine that <laughs> if <you're, laughs> that might have come up. Anybody who's listening, uh, who's been through our department in the past 20 years, uh, knows what I'm talking about. For all of the old timers out there, uh, you're missing out. Um, the students will collect at the office uh, in the days leading up to reading day of fall semester, waiting for the delivery of the Bickmore cookie platter. It's quite the event in the department. It's very large. Very large. So that gets you to geology. You spend a lot of time looking at clay. How did you go from a voice telling you to change your major to geology to spending all that time on a microscope? Um, well, clays are the, like the smallest, uh, some of the smallest minerals, right? And so I, I sort of was veering in the direction of mineralogy and that kind of thing because um, minerals are, look cool, <laughs> I guess. That's how much minerals are pretty and they I had in, do look cool in college. But anyway, but then when I was looking around for uh, graduate advisors, uh, somebody got me looking into uh, mineral surface chemistry. So that's just interact chemical interactions between the surfaces of minerals and like water and whatever's dissolved in the water, things like that. So as I got into that, I, I realized, you know, if that's what we're worrying about, if that's where the action is in low temperature mm -hmm. geochemistry, then um, you have to pay the most attention to the things with the most surface area which are clays. So you could have a, a, a system that water's running through that has only a small percentage of these tiny minerals, but the surface area um, of the whole thing is dominated by those small minerals because they're so small, you know. So anyway, that's how I started getting into clays. And 
in so an that was the in aspect an atomic force microscope. You. They do look cool. Oh, okay. So now take just a second. Explain to uh, the listeners atomic force microscope. I, I would imagine that most of our listeners don't own one of those. <laughs> well, the idea is um, you have your sample, and it's sitting on a, a piezoelectric tube. Okay, which uh, when you apply uh, a voltage to it, it moves it back and forth, right? So it, you can you can scan it around, and then you have a tip that's on a little diving board that's in contact or tapping against it, right? And then um, you have a laser that goes down and bounces off the back of that into a detector, so you can tell if the the tip is bending back or, or dropping down into a hole or whatever. And meanwhile, the Z-axis is moving the tip up and down and you're creating a 3D map okay. of the surface. And so you could deposit, for instance, some um, uh, clay minerals on a, a flat surface. And if they're dispersed well enough, you can see the individual crystals and things like that and have 3D um, models of them. One of the newer aspects of uh, getting a degree in geology at BYU involves the um, ability to choose getting a degree in environmental uh, geology. And you deal a lot with clays. How much interaction is there between clay mineralogy and clays in the environmental aspect of geology? Um, well, if you're dealing with soils, then you're going to have to deal with clays. So uh, soils is a lot of... Uh, um, what environmental geologists might be encountering and also the the water aspect of it. So so the point is that um, if you have a soil and you have any clays in there, they're going to be very, they're going to control a lot of reactions. Okay. And then if you're um, dealing with water, even going through an aquifer or something like that, and you're wondering about the chemical interactions that go on there, well, uh, the, the small minerals are going to dominate that more than the big minerals. So the clay is a lot more important than the quartz. Most, like a lot of times, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, they even use clays from an engineering standpoint in remediation efforts. Mm -hmm. um, based And is, is that also related to their surface chemistries? Yeah, so, well, there's certain kinds of clays um, that they can swell in the presence of water. And then the, the, if you're an ion trying to get through a layer of swollen clay, then uh, it's going to take a really, really long time. So you can put around a landfill or something like that, you can put a, a clay barrier that would slow down drastically um, how fast the like leachate. whatever chemicals yeah, leach out of the garbage and go into yeah. the, the aquifer. All right. Most of your work's in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of field trips. No. Nope. <laughs> Have you ever taken a field trip? <laughs> Why, yes. Yeah. Where did, where did you take your students on that field trip? Baker Hot Springs. <laughs> well, You never went back? To, not to that one, no. <laughs> what, what happened to Baker Hot Springs well, that made you not want to go back? So I think it was Matt Chandler. Yes, I think it was. Hot Springs and had second degree burns. <laughs> If Matt Chandler is listening, we all want to know if he has any hair on that leg. Because <laughs> on the way driving to the hospital in Delta... Um, and that might be the reason he doesn't yeah. have hair on that leg is because they took him to the hospital in Delta. It, well, they did a fine job over there in Delta. But on the way, he was sitting in the front seat with his feet up and one of the other students was looking at his leg and he goes... Looks like wax. <laughs> and I was like, not helping. <laughs> so. Oh, that's a great story. So we've got some opiates in him and he was uh, fine. He was fine. No, yeah. I remember him walking around the department a couple of days after that, you know, with the gauze bandages and yeah. And that was the last field trip. No, I, but I, I took field professors. Oh, <laughs> I like had go on some jointly with Steve Nelson. Gotcha. And after that, I, I was like, no, Riley Brinkerhoff, you can't just say, let's do a field trip uh, to Baker Hot Springs. <laughs> and I'd say, whatever. This involves some planning. Uh, this has to involve some planning with somebody who goes out in the field and does stuff a lot. Up closer to the source at Baker Hot Springs, where Matt fell through the crust, how hot is that water? It's about 80 degrees Celsius. 
so approaching 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, that that no one that explains the wax comment. Could have been 60. I can't remember. Still, that's going to be 175 mm-hmm. or so Fahrenheit. That's that's a lot of hot water. What are some of the things you're doing right now in your research? So um, I I actually started sh- um, I don't know, over a decade ago, sort of shifting what I research. Um, because our department only has a master's program and typically people who would go into a master's program rather than going on to someplace to get a PhD or something um, are not going to go on to a PhD. They just want to go get a job. So I I sort of uh, started um, changing what I do to make it so that if somebody studied with me, then they would have some skills, whether they go on to do you know uh, more basic research stuff like I do or um, whether they work for a company or something like that and so I started doing more with computer programming uh, I'd always done some with that but uh, more with that and having students who work with me um, do learn how to do that to some extent which is not as common among geologists as it is say among physicists or whatever and like you remember when we were students, they made us take a computer science. Yes, class. I remember right. we had to we had to program in Pascal. Pascal, which totally useless. It was not useless at the me. time. The, Today well, it's pretty useless. It turned out that in graduate school, I was getting these three D images of clay minerals underwater in acid, shrinking, and I was trying to um, get some data about how fast they shrink in different directions and stuff like that and um, so I had all this data in these images but the software that came with the microscope had no way of getting what I needed out of it so I found this free image analysis program that had a macro language that was a lot like Pascal and so then I was able to program my own analysis into it taking advantage of all the built-in stuff in that program. It warms my heart to hear that my suffering through that class at least had a benefit for somebody. Well, and it warms <laughs> my heart, too. I'm, I happily sacrifice your happiness. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah but so, it, it, it going through yeah. that class, though, I, I had taken a programming class in high school, so it wasn't hard for me. And I was like, oh, this is fun, you know. But... Uh, so it wasn't as painful for me as it was for, for me. a lot of people. It was painful for me. But at the same time, I had no clue how I would ever use this. You know? But then an opportunity presents itself. Well, it, it turned out that that was the time period when it was going toward... Um, you would get these programs, like the image analysis program, and Excel and Word and all that started adopting this, where you could write programs to make those like overarching programs do stuff um, and automate a lot of stuff. So you could basically not write that many uh, lines of code, but still make it do something fairly sophisticated because of all the built, you know, built in features that you were uh, manipulating. So that the programming now is a lot more like that for most people, working scientists at least. And then uh, back then it was just like they taught us how to do a checkbook program or something like that. That's I remember. as far as we got. So of course we did, could see how we could apply it later on. But nowadays um, there's so much stuff built into Python or MATLAB or any of those languages that you know you can you know in less than a semester be doing some really sophisticated analyses of data. Now you have a PhD in geology. Mm-hmm. How important, though, is this cross-discipline understanding that you're talking about? Students that are wanting to be geologists, understanding computer programming or chemistry or you know math. Well, if uh, you were a geologist who knew nothing about the math and computation type of stuff, and you found somebody who was that, right? They they knew all about that, but they didn't know anything about geology. You couldn't just say, um, you know, here's my data. 
analyze it, you know, and tell me what it means, right? You would have to be looking over their shoulder, telling them what to do all the time. So even a little bit of knowledge of what they can do, you know, can help you direct what they do, even if you're not the one doing it. Even if you can't write the program, understanding the how the yeah, program functions. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and when you start wrangling data, what you find out is that um, you can do stuff you're not supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, but we're at BYU. You've got to be careful with that statement. <laughs> well, I mean, you can... You can draw conclusions because of analyses that never should have been applied to that sort of data. And you really have to think about, okay, what does this number mean that I got out of this analysis? And the, so the more you know about it, the easier it, is, easier it is even to deal with somebody else you're hiring to do it. But, but um, so, so people who have both kinds of skills, so the, the background in some kind of science, and data analysis and um, uh, you know computation and math type of stuff. Um, they're called unicorns, right? Because uh, it's hard to find somebody to do that, but they need people somewhere in that continuum to even, even if you're a big oil company, to even be able to talk to the people who are doing the computational stuff. So am um, so I understanding this right? You're calling yourself a unicorn. Um, that's how I identify. Yeah. <laughs> we needed to have some headgear for Dr. Bickmore to wear today. Well, <laughs> so to continue that that line of questioning, there is a class you teach that I personally find somewhat intimidating. Uh, not mineralogy. I think it's geology four oh five. Is that the math class? Yeah. So it's the math applications class. Where did the idea? So when I was a student, when you were a student, that class didn't exist. Yeah. Where did the idea come from? Where did the, how did we see this need? Um, so, well, Alvin Benson did teach some kind of math class. I never took it, but anyway. So it came to be because Summer Ruper was on the faculty here. And then... The uh, queen of calculus, and Summer Ruper. So if you know Summer, she has a really mathematical mind. She's yes. brilliant to just come up with. She's a Cylon. Things. But with a good personality. With a good too. personality. That's right. She doesn't try to kill people. Yeah. Anyway, so she, she, um, we had been talking about how the students nowadays need to get some more of that, right? Um, for today's job market and what kind of science is being done. Also, the fact that, like, a lot of times geoscientists are dealing with just gobs of data that you can't deal with without basically making a program to deal with it, right? And so um, anyway, she said she didn't have time because she had so much money from grants <laughs> to, to um, do this, like design this class alone. So could I help her? So I said, sure, even though, you know, she would be way better at it than me because she'd actually taken the advanced math classes and things like that. Whereas I had not, I just sort of learned what I could on when I had to do something with it, you know. And so um, then we started designing the class and everything. And then she took a job at the University of Utah. And, and I said, she well, abandoned us. Yeah, it was all her idea but anyway. But I, I said, well, probably should go for with it, even if I'm not wouldn't be as good at it as Summer would. And so went forward with it. I, I think you're just as good as she is. I, you, you teach that class in the computer lab, and on you know Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at one o'clock when you finish teaching, I see students walking out of the computer lab, tears streaming down their faces. <laughs> so you must be doing something right. It's joy. <laughs> the tears, tears of joy. They can see that job in the horizon yeah, where they're going to have to do, yeah, partial derivatives and multivariable integrals, and we, we actually don't even get that far. Oh, the, really? The math we get to, like, you know, there's a whole class for linear algebra. There's yeah. a whole class for multivariate class. Differential uh, equations. And a whole class for differential equations. So basically, we just do um, some really basic linear algebra and show that how that can be applied in a lot of situations. And some really basic differential equations and how that can be applied. 
it's sort of amazing, like just with that little bit, how much opens up as far as what you can you can analyze or do. So, very cool. If you looked back at the 22 years you spent at BYU, and you had to pick one project, one grant, one area of research that you've been involved with that really stands out in your mind, what would that one thing be? Well, what I'm doing now obviously stands out. Because it's current. Yeah. (laughs) I have long-term memory problems. (laughs) But uh, right now, um, I'm doing something that's a little more practical than I usually do. And and that is that uh, we are looking at x-ray powder diffraction analysis. Um, and there's a problem with x-ray powder diffraction analysis. And what that, is x-ray powder diffraction? So you powder up some rock or something like that. Then you put it in the x-ray diffractor okay. and it, sk- it shoots x-rays at it at different angles and collects them at the same angle. And you can uh, tell, like it's sort of like uh, fingerprinting okay. the, the structure. And there's problems right? with it. Well, and the problem is the people doing it. <laughs> Are those our students? <laughs> well, it could be. Right? <laughs> well, so here's, here's, not everybody has an x-ray diffractometer, but, but taking geological samples and figuring out what uh, minerals are in there is obviously going to be a standard thing to do for lots of uh, geologists, right? And so say you take a sample that's a mixture of a bunch of different minerals and you don't have an x-ray diffractometer and you're not an expert in it anyway, uh, and you send it off to a commercial lab um, that uh, uh, says they'll do your x-ray diffraction analysis. And then you, um, they get, give you back the results, which is a diffraction pattern. And they say, well, it looks like there's some quartz and some clay in there. Not real helpful. Yeah. So, so. And I'm not that's, Dr. Bickmore, and I can see that that's not real helpful. So, <laughs> so, so that's the problem, right? Is yeah. that, that uh, these companies can't always get somebody who knows anything about minerals or what minerals are even, like, you know, there's like 6,000 minerals. Yeah. Or so, something like that. But uh, half how, of them are how clay. many do you encounter on an everyday yeah. basis, right? It's not that A couple many. dozen at the most. And so so if somebody's doing the analysis and trying to, of a mixture, right? So you have all these peaks and it's hard to tell which ones belong to which mineral, right? Um, it's easy to, uh, you know, use some peak matching program that comes with your x-ray diffractometer and say, oh, well, it's whatever right that that there's one occurrence of that they've ever found or something like that. So it's really right. common. So so that's the problem, right? This is, uh, um, you know, there's limits on how good the, the analysis can be, but there's no limit on how bad <laughs> ah. it can, can be. And, and, and they, they have uh, problems, obviously, hiring, because this is very common very, very common to send for geologists to send off their stuff to a lab like that and get back garbage. garbage. Yeah. So we're using uh, artificial intelligence. We, we really? generated a huge database with, I think, about one and a half million samples in it now. And I have a student right now using machine learning techniques to come up with algorithms to sort of come up with probabilities that this whatever mineral is in this mixture, right? So uh, anyway, that's what we're doing now. So we're do, I'm using all that uh, programming and- uh, So when did you start that? I mean, because this AI presence hasn't been around for your entire career. Yeah, well, so, I don't know. I, there was this program that I used to, for analyzing uh, X-ray powder diffraction patterns and I used it for a project in mineralogy so that students could get some experience analyzing a sample, you know, with some software that is was pretty common. And this program was actually an Excel spreadsheet programmed by Denny Eberl at the US Geological Survey in Boulder. 
and um, Denny had written macros, so which are programs written behind the Excel spreadsheet to automate a bunch of stuff. And anyway, so it was slow, it was clunky, clunky, but it worked. And um, but then it would only work on if you were running Windows uh, three or oh. Windows seven. <laughs> Was when this was a couple of day. days ago. Yeah. <laughs> Windows 3 or Windows 7, and then also uh, Excel 2003 or 2007, respectively. So um, anyway, it just got slower and slower and slower, and people had to have a dedicated computer running one of these old operating systems, so we couldn't do it in the computer lab. And um, then it wouldn't work at all. So. I got a couple students together and we programmed an alternative to it in MATLAB. And then instead of taking like five to 45 minutes for one step in this analysis, it took one, one second. That's a pretty good improvement. Yeah, so I thought, wow, uh, maybe we can do something with that. So I, I was reading about you know these problems we were talking about with X-ray powder diffraction analyses in general, and I said, you know, that seems like we should be able to automate. So I started reading about uh, uh, machine learning type of things. Started talking to Emily Evans and the math department about it. She's an applied mathematician, and then we wrote a grant proposal together, and the NSF funded it. And the reviewers were saying, yes, we absolutely need this. So. That's yeah. always a good thing. Yeah. How do you see AI affecting geology as a science going forward? Um, so it's really important for dealing with gobs of data, right? Because... And you are a data guy. Well, I wouldn't even say that. I'm just sort of a data guy compared to everyone else. In the world, <laughs> you know? You're the dataist guy in our department. Yeah. <laughs> and so... That, that's what I mean about people somewhere in the middle gotcha. that are, are in demand. It's, it's, even if you could just get people on either side talking to each other and have some idea what they're saying, right? Um, anyway, so what was the question? How do you see AI affecting what we do you know, going forward? I mean, will it make things easier? Will, it make things, will be, things be different? Will AI identify all of our rocks for us? Um, it may, like, uh, so I mean, I'm sure there will be more and more automation. We've always been having more and more uh, remote sensing type things, at which, like, you can totally use AI for, for a lot of that kind of stuff anyway. Um, and so I really see a need for people to be familiar with it enough to use it. Um, but... I don't think it's going to replace anytime soon the sort of content knowledge. I mean, it's just like uh, the chat GPT. Okay. I read an article the other day about some lawyer who who um, had it write a legal brief for him to give to court, and it had all these these uh, um, made up references. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Not a good thing. So uh, I don't know. I'm sure that will improve and everything, but uh, but on on the other hand, people are getting uh, more and more wary of how much of their data is actually on the internet. Because, Lots of it. Yeah, and uh, you know, you go on some website unless you're using a VPN or something, they can pinpoint where you are really pretty precisely. You know, not super precisely, but maybe not what close. room in your house. Yeah. <laughs> So, so anyway, I'm, I'm saying that I, uh, I, don't, I don't think that it will replace all of us with, with robots. When, and that's actually a good reason to get a, a technical degree. Right? There you go. So then you can make you the robots. You don't get replaced by robots. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just say for a second that there's some crazy person out there that is listening to this and they decide, oh, my gosh. I really want to be just like Dr. Bickmore. Do you have any advice or, you know, words of wisdom you would give to someone wanting to, you know, go down the pathway that you've gone down for your career? 
Well, number one, call the student uh, mental health services. <laughs> but, no, I mean, I just sort of, I, I, I have ADHD. So my path was like doing whatever I felt like. <laughs> I don't know. So I, now, is it required I, I, to have ADHD to be a mineral surface chemistry guru? Well, well once I found out I had it, I, uh, inattentive type ADHD, I realized that it's rampant among college professors. Like the typical absent-minded professor. Okay. I can think them. of a few in physics right off the top of my head. Anyway, uh, that's just something you deal with, but, but uh, I mean, it has its pluses and minuses. But uh, anyway, some stuff looking back that I did that I did not regret was, uh, number one, my sister told me, get a minor in philosophy because it'll help your writing. And, uh, and I figured out I could take philosophy ca classes that all counted for GE credits. So I did. And wow, they hammer your writing in there. I mean, and that's one thing. I mean, you know, just going out into uh, industry. Oh, you write every day. Yeah, and and your boss will literally hate you. Oh, if you're one of the ones that they have to edit your writing like Multiple. more than just surface. Yep. Stuff, right? Um, because there's legal ramifications for it. Uh, but anyway, the rest of your life will be a lot easier if you do something uh, while you're in school to improve your writing, right? And then, uh, oh, the philosophy came in handy. Like, the, I got to take his, uh, philosophy of science and science and religion classes, all counted for GE, but I've done stuff with them, you know? Done stuff with, uh, um, even gotten grants for... Very nice. Uh, uh, ...helping students feel better about science and, and understanding what science is and so on. I would imagine that a lot of undergraduates at any university view their GE as more of just a list of boxes they have to check off and not necessarily something that they could apply and tailor to their future. Yeah. Hmm. Well, overall, though, I, I would think of your education more than most students usually do in terms of skills, right? rather than just knowledge. I mean, the, the knowledge about this and that aspect of geology is built into the degree, the, the, uh, how much you gain skills is quite variable, right? And so the writing, the math, the computation, those are all hard skills that, that you would think writing would be, it would be easy to find geologists to um, to be decent writers to hire, right? But you talk to people who run those companies, not so easy, is it? Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Those underlying skills that will make you more marketable, make your life easier, make whatever you do produce better. Yeah, well, and the fact is you have plans and I can tell you to follow your dreams or whatever, but you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the job market and what this or that subfield is going to be like and so on. But you need to you need to find skill sets that would enhance your chances in whatever it is you want to do and not leave you flat if you uh, you don't get in the exact niche that you are looking for. Excellent. Excellent advice. At, at BYU, there's a lot of talk about the the difference between science and religion, mm -hmm. the conflict potential between science and religion. What's your view about that relationship at BYU? The relationship at BYU? Between science and religion. Well, I don't know about B BYU so much, like it varies from person yeah. to person. But I'll tell you what I think about it in there general. There we go. Okay. And that is that like people who tell you that there is no conflict between science and religion are blowing smoke up your rear end. <laughs> Excellent. So, so if you get another professor in here and they say stuff like that, I want you to take this clip <laughs> and put it right after that in their podcast okay. interview and have we're, me we're, telling them. We got all the tech people on that right now. <laughs> okay, and here, here's why. 
Okay, they're not totally different, right? But on the one hand, you have science where we have rules about what counts as science. So if you want to uh, publish a scientific paper, you have to appeal to naturalistic causes. No God stuff or supernatural stuff at all, right? Um, and there's practical reasons for it, right? Number one, you don't get lazy and just say, oh, God did it, so there it is, you know? That's not what science is. That sh shouldn't be the end goal of science, probably. Um, also, if we want to be, science to be sort of a universal thing that everyone in the world can participate in, right? And we don't want Hindu science and LDS science and, and uh, Catholic science and whatever. Well, then we have to have sort of boundaries like that. Okay, so there's practical reasons about it. Now, what about when you try and put them together? If you have one system where that says, yeah, there's supernatural causes, um, and another system that says, well, if there are, we're going to ignore it, then of course there's going to be conflicts. <laughs> like, and it's going to vary like what conflicts there are with different religions and so on. And in our religion, it's like, okay, what is exactly is official doctrine or whatever and and even that uh um you know we can get continuing revelation which may change our perspective to some degree or whatever so so the interface there even though in a lot of ways you know we're all about collecting evidence or observations and trying to make sense of it right um there's still going to be con some conflicts so my advice is relax right that's like okay well we'll think about that and figure out if there's any way to resolve it or whatever but there may not be if the if something supernatural did happen for instance right like try and try and i i actually saw a book once i didn't read it but trying to the physics of uh, of resurrection or something like that it's just Something good flying off the bookshelves. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, nobody's going to you know, do science and come to the conclusion that Jesus was resurrected. Right. Right. So either it happened miraculously or it didn't, you know. No, I, so. think, I think your comment, maybe some of us or some people just need to relax a little bit. I think that's an amazing comment, especially in the way the world is today. There's too many things we get too uptight about. Well, you've been hanging on for a long time, and we have one more question for Dr. Bickmore. So for those of you who've endured the entire journey, this is the question you have been waiting to be asked. Dr. Bickmore, professor of mineralogy, Brigham Young University, what's your favorite mineral? Vanadinite. Okay, that you're going to have to explain. <laughs> How I don't, I'm, a, I'm looking for a raise of hands of everybody who's listening here. here. Who knows what vanadinite? It, one you I did, showed. Her oh, one. you showed you showed our the, the our tech in the booth what what it is. Okay, yeah. explain to the rest of everybody in uh, sixty words or less what it, what would this be? It Chemical a, formula it's a symmetry vanadate. Okay, okay, mineral. So uh, I like ore minerals, you know, and. Um, so there's some really weird stuff with lead. And lead sometimes has lone pairs in it, which causes distortions in the structure around it. And then also vanadium isn't that common to have a, like you could, as a trace mineral or a trace element, right? But, but not as a, the main um, thing in the, the structure of minerals. So anyway, and the color is cool and they make nice crystals. All 11 of our listeners are Googling that right now to see what it looks like. Yep. Yeah. We've been pleased to hear from Dr. Barry Bickmore today, Professor of Geological Sciences at BYU uh, for the past 22 years. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today. This has been Why Rocks, a Department of Geological Sciences podcast. <laughs>